morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm a field Negro today. I got my head all my hair all over my head, just all over. <laughs> um, I had some thoughts about this whole house Negro commentary, Miss Bella. House nigger. Yeah. I, you know, I guess the thing about when I actually saw the footage, it's been a week since I saw the footage. I just ain't say nothing. But, you know, kind of what the part that wasn't funny to me is that, you know, and I don't think he's my type cup of tea in terms of humor anyway. You know, humor is subjective. But, you know, the people who were occasionally house niggers or house Negroes all the time or whatever, it wasn't by their choice. So, I mean, I guess what was most striking to me is here's one white man talking to another white man about what he's going to do and how he's going to do it and kind of making, bringing in, um, too good to be in the field he's too thing. good to be in the fields type legacy. But you know, when you were, when somebody owned you, they decided whether you were, where, what you were too good for or not too good for. And they decided whether you were in the house or in the fields or wherever you were, what you were doing. And that changed. It wasn't that you set it up. Some people think, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, she was light skinned or he was mixed. So he was a house Negro. That's not how it worked. It was at the discretion of the person who claimed to own the other person. They decided, you know, who was the house nigga for now. And they could change that tomorrow because they owned you. It was their decision. But that's all. So I guess it's kind of like, I feel like even for the people who, who were, you know, house Negroes, they wasn't choosing, you know, choosing that. They wasn't living that, loving that life. They wasn't loving that life necessarily. I mean, I guess it's all kinds of people, you know, in all ages. Because we were talking about that the other day. Um, well, maybe today. About, I don't know who you had told me, said, as I was asking my mother about Africa town. Because, you know, in Detroit, there's a Greek town. There's a, um, there's a little India area. There's a, um, you said a Chinatown. I don't know where be, Chinatown to is. Arab area. And there's so many black people. I'm like, well, what was the problem with Africa Town? You know? Oops, hey y'all, I'm still here. And one of the things that I was thinking about is you had said that when the casinos were coming, there was a black person who was trying to own a casino, bring a casino. Don Barton. And someone said, Dennis Archer. Dennis Archer? Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay. Dennis Archer said he not trying, what did he say? Let me not miss. He ain't trying to make one black person rich. He ain't trying to make one black person rich. So therefore he didn't give him the casino, so he gave him all, they were all given to white people, basically. There was some black people who were part owners of the Greek town casino, but basically they're all white owned. Yeah, and Don Barton had experience in running casinos. It wasn't like he was just some fly by night, you know. Yeah. So I mean, I was just trying to understand the rationale, like, um, you know, why wouldn't we try to, you know, help one another and support one another? I mean, it's like we have bought into this fear of BS of, you know, I'm not trying to help black people. I wouldn't do anything to help help a black person get rich god forbid not all of us but some of us but i think it's it's worth examining and trying to you know understand what what is that really about <laughs> in the um black woman in medicine um film the woman was talking about the fact that a lot of times you know or someone was talking about the fact that a lot of times black students are afraid even to make eye contact and associate with one another and connect with one another. Um, you know, it's like we bought into some stuff that's crazy. Other people connect with one another, join hands with one another, help one another, benefit from connections, benefit from each other's experience. I, I think what happened is during the 60s and the 70s when they opened up a lot of the institutions to minority and diverse students, there were protests, there were um, changes that the students insisted on the institutions making. I think then they made a conscious effort to weed out potential militants and radicals and people who had 
any kind of semblance of thinking for themselves. So they consciously in these graduate schools brought in the corporate lawyer types, the corporate medical types, the ones who aren't going to question stuff. So I think that's part of it. Well, I definitely noticed that when I was going through the archives of the Barnard Organization of Black Women um, that, you know, you could see women coming from Detroit, black Detroit. You could see women coming from black Harlem. You could see women coming from black Chicago and having a certain, here's some, oh no, that's not mulberries, what is that? Ooh, is it edible? Having a certain consciousness and a certain, you know, desire to connect with other black students. Um, people who were used to being around black people reached out to black people and wanted to talk about black things. And by the time I got there, a lot of the young women, especially the generations coming right behind me, had grown up in primarily white environments. They were used to being the only black person and they were not um, organizing anything necessarily or that was not their first thing they didn't come into the institution and feel uncomfortable like I did like we're the black folks they were like oh yeah business as usual let me just study and the rest of us was like all oh, the black folks come on over here let's get together let's connect but it was a whole different vibration whole different expectation and they had already been oriented you know, in lots of ways, that still doesn't. <laughs> you still can't kill the spirit. And before the 60s and the 70s, they didn't let enough people in to have an organization. If you got one black student coming through every three or four years, or two or three coming through every three or four years, it's not enough to organize and do anything. All you can do in that situation is survive. Right, and Barner definitely seemed to have a policy of one every four years, because one of the black women got admitted when she showed up and they realized she was black they were like oh no you you can't <laughs> um we already got our this year right you gotta wait a couple years till we already got one black person so yeah maybe that's why Zora Neale Hurston was so old <laughs> and she went that's my favorite story have y'all heard that Zora Neale Hurston was 28 when she went to Barnard but they thought she was 18 man if I could go back, how old am I now? If I could go back and be 35 or 25 now, woo! As racist Dr. Seuss says, the places I'd go. <laughs> so anyway, walking and talking today. It's a beautiful, hot day. It was hot overnight too. It's a beautiful day in Detroit. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, fabulous. And you know what you gotta do today, right? For you. Be fabulous. Be fabulous you. Peace.